To get the entire episode and all our content, look for a podcast of Biblical Proportions on all podcasting platforms. Hello everybody and welcome to a podcast of Biblical Proportions. Episode 20, Call Me Ishmael. Sometimes when a successful show finishes its run, executive types will look into the possibility of creating a spin-off. Sometimes the spin-off can become as successful as the original story. In this episode, we'll see how a minor yet intriguing biblical character in the original holy book not only got his own story in a new holy book, but the writers also went back to the original story, to the original canonical story, and changed it retroactively. Case in point, Ishmael. Ishmael was Abraham's son by the Egyptian slave Hagar. Even though there is little about Ishmael in the Hebrew Bible, there was just enough meat on the bone for the Arab writing room of the year 700 to pick up his story and run with it. They crafted a rich afterlife for Ismail 1,000 years after his book was closed. There's loads to explore. Let's dive in. Hi, Omri. Hey, Gil. And we want to give a shout out to Barmi Skouser. For supporting a show, Barmi Scouser. Barmi Scouser. I don't think she's a Scouser. Uh-huh. Uh, That's a shame. <laughs> <laughs> for becoming a member of the show, thank you for supporting our project. Thanks. Okay, Ishmael, Ismail. Uh, First, just a little bit uh, nitpicking. Mm-hmm. You said uh, the year seven hundred. I don't want our audience to get confused and uh, believe that that text was written exactly at the year uh, seven, uh, approximately approximately 700 let's say and also it, it was written ad ce and compiled over generations yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. so this is uh we have yeah. a real world uh, confirmed uh, uh evidence uh, evidence of how of these tempering stories. with the text <laughs> so, with the evidence <laughs> yes uh so let's first of all let's talk about Ishmael in the Bible. So just quickly, what we, what we are told about Ishmael, he is Abraham's firstborn, yes. but not by his legal wife. His legal wife, she's the one who pushed yeah. her slave, Hagar, to, co- to consummate her concubineship yeah, yeah, yeah. with Abraham. Yeah, the term legal, illegal, let's not uh, be that, that misleading or anachronistic. Uh, Legal or illegal, the fact that it is okay, it is okay to make an offspring with your slave, mm-hmm. and the word here "slave" in English it it means a slave. female slave and a male slave. But in Hebrew, they in ancient Hebrew they made that distinction between a slave, eved, eved, and from the verb uh, oved, oved, work to work, yeah, or even to worship. They use that word mm-hmm. verb also to worship and right. shifcha which is a female slave. That distinction is kind of important because it tells us that the physical labor that was attributed to male slaves wasn't a part of the female experience as a slave. She she has no rights or whatever to inheritance and stuff like that. And uh, and also he takes her if he wants to. Exactly. But in terms of legality, the offspring that she brings him I don't think that in the ancient perspec- uh, perspective yeah, yeah, we of know. those times and these it's places, it was no. that, uh, you know, bastard, bastard. Or yeah, yeah like it that. wasn't bastard. There was a legal status that was lower than the yeah. official children with your yeah. official wife. And we see it in the story. This is why Abraham gives Itzhak, his second son, by yeah. Sarah, gives him all the inheritance. But that is why Sarah also has the right to kick out. Yeah. Uh, okay. Hagar. So she tells uh, in two different uh, stories. She tells Abraham, Abraham, expel uh, Hagar either because she now thinks that she's all that just because she has a baby or she's pregnant, like Akela, yeah, Akela yeah. Benea, yeah. like Hekela. she made she, light of her. Yeah. She didn't, uh, you know, prepare coffee fast yeah. enough. Or it's the opposite of taking her seriously, taking yes. her lightly. Yes. And in the second story, it's the ceremony of, it, of Isaac's uh, winning. We talked about that yeah. in the Isaac uh, in previous uh, episodes. And there, uh, Ishmael is playing maybe with uh, Yitzhak. 
but it, it's, it's not clear exactly what's the beef, but basically the, what we understand is the beef is the inheritance. She wants her boy to mm -hmm. inherit uh, Abraham and give him all the, what are the people that uh, he's supposed to birth. So both times when they are expelled, a divine intervention mm -hmm. saves them and, and tells us Ishmael, he's important. Yeah, he, he will, will get his due. He will get his due. He will uh, birth a people. Yeah, he will be a major ancestor of the Ishmaelites of the Arabs. Arabs, basically. Yeah. And in Hebrew, Arab, Aravi, it has a lot of roots that you can uh, that that it can be. One of them is Erev, Meorav, mm. mixed. Yeah. And we know that the Arabs was then and still is now like a blank term yeah. for very very different kinds of people yeah with different kinds of uh, tradition dialects etc etc the people that uh, they are i think specifically mentioned the most important people that uh, ishmael is the father figure of are the kederites which is his second son so if you listen to our podcast then you immediately rec immediately recognize that his second son, the Kederites, which gave birth to one of the most strongest people in the area, it was an explanation of their dominance in their uh, own geography yeah. and stuff. And not, and not being and not vice versa. And also not being assholes. Like uh, Nimrod, uh, that was uh, yeah. very warlike, he birthed the Babylonians and all the empires that are violent and we don't like them. So when the writers uh, told us that uh, Ishmael eventually became very good with the bow, <laughs> it's because they, they saw the Kederites in front of their eyes, so they decided that they are descendant of Ishmael and Ishmael had the same uh, <laughs> traits and characteristics of their... What a coincidence. Yeah. <coughs> Basically, the Kederites were there first. <laughs> yeah, before, before yeah. Ishmael. Uh, but the fact that like, they were a dominant, very familiar in the area, there's, uh, there's evidence that they appear in uh, Assyrian scriptures, cuneiform scriptures, as early as the 8th century BC. So also that tells us that the story was written not earlier than the 8th century BCE, at least that part. Just to cap off uh, the recap, so what we know about Ishmael, he's not the heir, but he's an ancestor of great people, cast away twice. He got the privilege of burying his father, unlike Abraham's other sons by a Torah. Yeah, so a later addition. A later edition so that's like a but, but that's an honor so he wasn't expelled he was yeah. cast away twice returned twice and he w was there to bury his father yeah and we're told that his pere adam which in modern hebrew is uh, a beast a of beast, a man yeah something negative yeah and yado bakol viad kolbo we still use that phrase it's he's involved in a lot of things yeah and we're told like shkon alechav he will uh, live with his brothers yeah we live with his brothers brothers but the word is imagine that you have a house and you live in that house so the i think i think it's not hard to imagine most yeah. people have house <laughs> yeah. and a regular a house. regular person lives in a house mm. uh, in an important important person resides in a house mm. in an important house like an official residence yeah the house of the israeli parliament the knesset the word that we use is not the same word as house, like the house of parliament. It's the same word as we use mishkan, mishkan. So it's like it's higher. Yeah. So he resides among his brothers. Mm, what does that tell you? In parenthesis, maybe he has some kind of dominance over them. He's more important than them. But if we see the English translation, it says he will be a wild man and uh, he, he his hand a lot of hands will be against him and him against a lot yes, of hands. It's very negative. Yeah, it's a negative connotation. A wild man, pere adam, it can mean in an earlier Hebrew context, someone that is wild, but in a sense of a lib liberation of freedom. <coughs> like the Bedouins. Yeah, who like no can go tribes. wherever yeah. they want to go. Yeah, they live in, a wi in the wild. It doesn't mm. mean that they are wild. Yes, it's, it's unlikely that this is a, a, a negative uh, thing said about him because all the other things we know about him and are told about him point to a positive yeah. direction. So it's like you are not the chosen one by Yahweh, but you are still chosen. 
And the Kedarites were considered... I don't know if the Kedarites is an empire, but Kedarites slash Arabs, which Assyrians also call them Arabs in some instances, the fact that they were important in that area means that you can't, uh, you can't really offend their founding father in a, in a sense that you can't make him that weak. Unlike the Moivites or the Edomites, like the, who were conceived by rape, uh, raping a <laughs> lot. Incest. Incest. incest they are... Uh, our neighbors, our direct neighbors and enemies. The Kedarites are from a different sphere. Yeah, the they sphere do trade they also. They do trade, a lot you, of trade. You yeah. work with them. The, in the height of their powers in the 6th century BCE, the Persians used them as some kind of a convoy, uh, convoy. convoys of trade between Gaza. Uh, there were, they were like an incense uh, industry there. So they were, and they were good with bows, as we know, Later from history that uh, yes. nomadic tribes are good with bows and, and, and to, to your earlier point and, uh, and, uh, another thing interesting about the Kedarites they had a lot of princesses Nesim. Princesses. Princesses. Ah, princesses princesses female female princes, princes. like uh, according to their annals the Assyrian annals the, the annals <laughs> annals annals <laughs> the annals <laughs> they name uh, quite a few like uh, Zabiba Samsi Tabua like Nice names. <laughs> and we're told that he will birth uh, 12 uh, princes in the, in the translation. In the Hebrew, it's Nesim. Today, it's the, world, it's the word that we use yeah. for president. president. But the root means like above, some, yeah. someone that is higher than you. So it could be princes. Could be it, princes or tribe leaders. Yeah. The same as later. There were twel- 12 tribes of the Hebrews and the Israelites. Right, yeah. right. So there's a strong parallel here, mm-hmm. again, that shows us that he's an important and positive person. To your earlier point about the fact that he shachan mm-hmm. with his uh, neighbors, mm-hmm. Ishkon, Ishkon uh, reside. So in the King James tra- uh, translation, it says, he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. So there's like a concerted effort mm-hmm. Either, I guess, as the story progressed, then you, they wanted to lower all the non-correct uh, yeah. lineage people, and they just made even, like his good things became negative things, and, uh, or, or just became meaningless. He resides I with his brethren. I think that uh, the English translation probably was based on a much later commentary by, you know, rabbis or whatever. Yeah that they <coughs> ask themselves theological questions, how can it be that X, A, B, R, R, and then they got uh, theological conclusions uh, that... Uh, we are awesome, a- as they're not awesome. Exactly. <laughs> as we know that uh, <laughs> theological conclusions also, tend to go also one na- way. Also nationalist uh, <laughs> conclusions. You watch uh, the Euros, you watch the World Cup, all the players are just like so into their national anthem that always says how awesome they are and yeah. their neighbors are always evil and they are chosen by God and their land is beautiful yeah. and uh, yada, yada, yada. So it's not, uh, it's still here. Yeah, it's a very basic emotional thing to be biased to your, uh, towards your own story. And, uh, yeah. yeah, and to make up your own story, to cherry pick and invent new narratives that don't exist. So we can, that's a good segue to Ishmael becoming Ismail. We know from nationalist histories. From that the history of nationalism. And history of nationalism that what uh, people who wrote the national stories and national narratives, what they did, they looked in the past. They found all kinds of people that weren't necessarily that important, that impactful or don't actually fit the the uh, the story that you're trying to tell so you just fudge things up and you say oh this guy was actually a hero this guy was a bad guy because he yeah. doesn't fit our the story that we tell now he was the enemy of this guy so let's uh, make him a stupid uh, low life person and people believe it hundreds of years later and they recite it as if it's a uh, gospel but pun intended and it's not that hard to do uh, you have up till now about 80 years of Batman mythology, let's say. Mm-hmm. You have different versions of the Batman origin story. Yeah. One Joker. of them that we know from our childhood. When I was a kid, I knew <laughs> that Joker ambushed uh, Batman's <laughs> parents outside of a movie theater. And then he said, uh, why do you dance with the devil on the midnight, whatever, something like that. And then he murdered them. Oh. But then in this version, in oh. this jo- Joker, those heathens... Yes. 
It they wasn't don't, even the Joker who they murdered. Don't, they don't respect tradition. <laughs> yeah, you ch- you're changing the story? Yeah. And now Spider-Man is black? <laughs> no, it doesn't come from the correct lineage. Wait, Spider-Man is black now? There is uh, in the Spider-Man uh, multiverse. Uh, yeah. There's a black Spider-Man. To get the entire episode and all our content, look for a podcast of Biblical Proportions on all podcasting platforms.